I would like to introduce our uh, keynote speaker today, uh, Nick Van Dam, the global CLO for McKinsey and Company. Welcome, Nick. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here among a group of uh, people who are uh, passionate about uh, learning and development, similar as myself. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, leading uh, learning and development uh, for McKinsey globally for our 25,000 uh, people. Um, I'm just wondering who is here from a corporation? Okay, quite a number of folks. Um, in addition to, uh, to my McKinsey role, I'm also a uh, visiting professor at uh, three different uh, universities. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, they have a fantastic program, an executive doctorate program for uh, people who like to become chief learning officers like myself, uh, a two-year program. Um, I'm, also, um, I'm also the academic director of an international master class learning and development leadership at a business school called Nijenrode uh, in the Netherlands, uh, a blended seven-month program. And uh, last, um, I'm also a visiting uh, professor at IE University. Um, is there anybody from IE University in the room? Nobody? Um, IE, as some you might know, is well known for its innovation in learning, and particularly also uh, digital uh, learning. And finally, my third hat, um, I started a foundation for children on digital learning about a decade ago. It's called e-learning for kids. And this foundation develops digital content for children between 5 and 12. We make it available on the internet for free, but also work with many schools around the world who do not have access to the internet or only they have poor connection. And we make it available in an offline format. It's all free and also a lot of content is in, uh, in Spanish. Um, now, um, I was looking yesterday at this, uh, at this uh, room, actually, and it looks a little bit like the picture here, right? So, uh, filled with people until the, until the end. And um, as some of you are, uh, are in academic institutions as well, you know what typically the challenges of any presentation like this, right? So, the first 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, I grab your attention. But soon after that, and I see a lot of laptops and smartphones, uh, basically messages are kicking in, and then I start competing actually for your attention. And in a worst case scenario, uh, this is what happens. Uh, and at the end of a lecture, uh, you know, people start thinking about a coffee break, and um, attention span goes up. So what I hope actually uh, this morning is uh, uh, to keep your attention and, and basically um, Hopefully, it will be an interesting story for you to listen to. Because we are living in an extraordinary time. There is massive disruption ahead of us. Disruption caused by what the World Economic Forum called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. A revolution similar to the first revolution, the second and the third, driven by advancements in technology. And as Anand mentioned yesterday, uh, and he was referring to artificial intelligence, machine learning, 3D printing, the Internet of, th internet of Things, the mobile internet, robotization, all these technologies have a tremendous impact on work that people do, and also on the skills that are needed in the future. And what's interesting, if you reflect on time, if you think about uh, technology advancements over time, um, breakthroughs are speeding up tremendously. Think about the mobile internet. The first phone call was made in 1876. Then it took about 115 years before we got the first website. And then only 16 years, and this year we celebrate that the smartphone, the iPhone, was launched only 10 years ago. And think about what an impact the smartphone had on everything. But also think about uh, robotics. The first robot, the Jenny, the spinning machine, was launched in the United Kingdom in 1764. It took about 200 years before GM 
had his first robots at his plant in the United States in 1962. And then only 48 years later, Google acquired a company, a Japanese company actually, and they, they launched a robot, the chef. And last but not least, I think about three, uh, printing. The printing press, 1448, took about 500 years before we got the first computer printer, and then 38 years before we got 3D printing. So basically speeding up. And also, if you think about reach, right? So how much time does it take to reach 50 million users? It took for, um, for the radio about 38 years, TV 13 years, uh, four years for the iPod, three years for the internet, uh, one year for Facebook, then we had Twitter, nine months, uh, Angry Bird, 35 days. And thanks to all of you guys, Pokemon Go, only 14 days. And if you think about some of these technologies, what's the impact? Think about 3D printing. It took Adidas 12 weeks with six people to design a new prototype. Today, thanks to 3D printing, it only takes them two weeks with two people. Artificial intelligence. This is Amelia. Amelia is a robot. Amelia speaks 20 different languages. Amelia works in call centers. And if you are on the phone with Amelia, you hardly hear that it's not a human being. This is at the start of its penetration in many organizations. If you think about self-service today, is there somebody here from Sydney, from, the, from Sydney, Australia? Um, well, if you look at self-service check-in everywhere, right? So less and less people need it, technology will do it for us. Last year, a hotel was opened in Japan uh, where you basically were checking in at the desk and a robot was welcoming, welcoming you, basically ask you uh, information about you know, your registration. The robot will check you in and the robot will ask you, should we bring your luggage to the room or should we store it for you? And then, indeed, the robot will store your, your luggage. Amazon started last year with a pilot in the UK to, to deliver packages within 30 minutes after ordering in your backyard. Domino's Pizza started, also, pizza started also piloting already delivery of pizzas in your, in your backyard. And then, of course, the autonomous car. In September last year, uh, Uber launched a pilot in Pittsburgh, where basically an Uber car will pick you up and will bring you to your destination. Now think about this. Uber, they currently employ a couple of hundred thousand people who are driving the cars, and now Uber is already piloting the autonomous car. And globally, an estimate of 18 million people are taxi drivers. Now, let me take you to another example. No, this isn't a runaway truck, and no, it's not an outtake from the action movie Speed. This is a conventional 18-wheeler that drives itself, thanks to a $30,000 retrofit. San Francisco startup Auto, which Uber bought this summer, made history with this truck. It completed the world's first truck autonomous delivery, carrying 50,000 cans of Budweiser from a brewery in Fort Collins, Colorado, to Colorado Springs, 120 miles away. The human drove the truck onto the highway, flipped on self-driving mode, and spent the next two hours of interstate chilling in the back seat. Autonomous cars may get all the buzz, but teaching trucks to drive themselves could deliver major economic and safety benefits. With 3 million drivers in the U.S., trucks carry 70% of American freight. But there still aren't nearly enough human drivers to do the job. Most new drivers quit within a year. And because you people can't stop buying stuff online, demand is only going to go up, and that shortage will just get worse. 
and roughly 400,000 trucks crash every year, killing about 4,000 people and costing the economy billions of dollars. Human error is nearly always to blame. Otto says the solution is a robot that doesn't get tired, angry, drunk, or distracted. So we're able to perceive everything, we're able to act faster, and as a, a result, we're able to make that truck driver monitoring the system and the act of driving much safer. Again, a huge, huge impact actually on potential impact on the industry, right? It's Three million truck drivers in the United States alone. So it's going to be fascinating to see how, what will happen actually. Now, if you look at the, if you were discussing kind of the impact of technologies, there's one huge impact on technologies on organizations. Uh, a lot of organizations are not fast enough to change, to adopt, to be proactive, and to be sustainable, successful. If you look at the lifespan of companies, companies on the, you know, the, the most prestigious companies, the S&P 500 companies, Companies were on the list in 1935. They had a lifespan of 90 years. It dropped to 55 years, 45 years, 30 years in 75, 20 years in 2015, and it's estimated that the company who will be on the list in 2027 will only have a lifespan of 13 years. And we are talking here about uh, you know, the, the S&P 500 companies. Now, what does it all mean for jobs? Well, it's one thing that's for sure. Lifetime employment doesn't exist anymore in one organization, right? So if a company only exists for so many years, it means that people need to change jobs, they need to change companies all the time. Who has read this book, The Second Machine Age? Some of you. Uh, two professors from MIT. And basically what they are saying is, this is the best time in history for people who have the right skills. Because there are tremendous opportunities uh, to make an impact. At the same time, this is the worst time in history for people who do not have the right skills because computers and robots are taking away their jobs at an accelerated pace. And a study done by the World Economic Forum shows actually the likelihood of Oxford, Oxford, sorry, Oxford the likelihood of uh, automation of your job. Now think about telemarketeers. There's a 99% chance that the jobs will become automated, right? So I mentioned the IE intelligence, the robots, 99%. Accountants and auditors, thanks to machine learning, yes, 94%. People who work in retail, thanks that everybody's buying, buying, buying more and more online, 92%. Technical writers, uh, computers can write amazing, amazing books today. News articles. Uh, real estate agents, world processor and typist, machinist, economist, and the good news is if you are a dentist, it's not likely that a robot will soon take over your job. So if you think about upscaling or rescaling, maybe that's something to keep, keep that in mind for, uh, for your children, my son. Um, McKinsey, and there have been a number of reports on this. Ox the Oxford study, very famous, was published in 2003. The World Economic Forum last year. And also McKinsey has done quite a bit of research on this. And based on our insight, we are saying, well, you need to take a look at the different activities that people perform. And if an activity is highly predictable, there's a high chance that that part of your job will become autom automated. But if it's, you know, like managing people, managing others, well, guess what? There's only a 9% chance that that part of your job will be automated. So predictable work. And there are a lot of, inter you know, a lot of innovations, actually, in, uh, in this. Now think about <laughs> this move in the <laughs> Thank you.
machine launched last year, um, and there are you know a couple of million people work in the food industry, right? So uh, another impact. Now, if you think about this, what are the implications for skills? And the World Economic Forum has done some some pretty good work actually, and they predict that there are a number of competencies very important over the next five years. The blue ones are the cognitive skills, uh, problem solving, obviously, because the world is more complex, there are more problems to figure out how to do that. But the fastest growing competence is ideation, is creativity. Um, an IBM study from a couple of years confirmed that as well. They said the, one of the key competencies for a CEO is creativity. And why is creativity so important? Creativity has to do with ideation, and ideation will drive innovation. And companies who need to succeed in the future, they need people who can think about new business models, new products, new services, new way of working, etc. People with an innovation mindset. Last year, IBM hired over 1,200 people with just a design background to think about what kind of products need to be designed, actually. McKinsey acquired two leading design companies, Lunar in California and Veriday in, uh, in Sweden, bringing in a lot of people who have a design background. At IE, here in Spain, they will launch in September a bachelor degree, design and business. Basically, educating people in ideation, in creativity, but also in business, actually. But if you look at the competencies, the social skills continue to be important, but also digital competence, digital literacy is very, very, very key. And if you look at statistics on digital literacy, uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for improvement. 44% of people in the EU are not sufficient qualified or developed, they don't, don't have a sufficient digital competence. And of course, there are different levels of proficiency in digital, but that's a key competence also for organizations. That if they want to embrace and implement technologies, people need to have uh, a digital competence at different proficiency levels. And the exciting part, too, is that there are many, many different jobs that are already available today and will become available in the future. As I mentioned, it's 10 years ago that the iPhone was launched. At that time, there were no app developers. Today, there are 12 million mobile app developers around the world. In the United States, there are bachelor and master degrees for people who like to design drones, become drone instructor, etc. So, a lot of very exciting, very new roles that will become available. But of course, we need to think about how do we upskill, reskill people from the jobs they're in today to the jobs for the future. And that will bring me to the theme of my presentation. The theme, learn or lose. Because if you look at a lot of research data on learning, unfortunately, 60% of people indicate that they learn nothing or only a little bit by doing their job. And if you think that your job might go away in three, four, five years from now, uh, that's pretty scary. There's a huge need for uh, people development over the next decade. And I believe companies need to start transforming their learning and development practices. But also, there's a huge role for the individual, for yourself, to reflect on your career, where you are in your, in your fields today, and what might happen over the next couple of years. So let me start with, uh, uh, with companies. 
Companies need to start embracing lifelong learning practices and helping their people to develop the skill sets for future jobs. And there is a huge business case for that. A good friend of mine, he is a venture capitalist in Boston, and last summer I spent time with him and I said, Mike, how do you decide in which companies you want to invest? And he said, Nick, there are basically three criteria. Number one, it's the team. Number two, it's the team. And number three, it's the team. It's all about people. Do you have the right folks actually on the team? Because if you have developed a business plan, and you probably uh, know this, uh, the minute the ink is dry, the market has changed, there are competitors, etc., etc. So do you have the people who basically are successful in pulling this whole thing through and being successful in driving uh, impact of the organization? Many, many companies have launched uh, corporate universities. GE is well known for this. Uh, they launched their uh, corporate academy, the corporate university, uh, over uh, over 100 years ago, actually. Uh, but over the last uh, decades, many many more companies have launched a kind of corporate university. The same with uh, McKinsey. Uh, let me see if I can show you this. The video. world is changing significantly and at an unprecedented pace. Client demands are greater, and expectations of our people are increasing. Given this, we must continue to evolve how we develop our people. McKinsey Learning is innovating and transforming as a leader in the L&D profession in the 21st century. But what is 21st century learning? Did you know millennials check their smartphone on average 43 times per day? What if McKinsey's learning development met our learners where they are? 21st century learning is personalized. From ordering our coffee, to our weather and news apps, to entertainment, personalized learning involves approach, curriculum, and learning environments tailored by learners and for learners to meet their different needs and aspirations. Learning that is personalized needs to be self-directed, relevant, journey-focused, and strengths-based. With 100 billion neurons and half a quadrillion connections in the brain, what if McKinsey leveraged brain science to build its learning programs? 21st century learning is scientific. Learning works when it changes behaviors. The latest scientific research on how the brain learns, including cognitive science, neuroscience, psychology, and other mind-brain sciences, is defining how to increase retention and application of learning. Scientific learning must be evidence-based and delivered via learning nuggets. It must be engaging and memorable informed by well-being and improved by analytics and measurements. And finally, consider the digital reality of today where only 10% of learning happens through formal learning. What if McKinsey's learning was available everywhere? 21st century learning is connected. Today, learning occurs anywhere and anytime in collaboration with a network of friends and colleagues that share common interests. It draws on the power of today's digital technology to fuse people's passions and individual and collective experiences across generations. It fosters common purpose and innovative insight. Connected learning is boundless and social. McKinsey has the opportunity to play an instrumental role in creating an environment where our colleagues can keep learning and growing at an extraordinary rate, thereby achieving a level of client impact and personal fulfillment that is today nearly unimaginable. 21st century learning is the future and will set the pace for learning and development. This is Learning at McKinsey. Yeah, organizations are, are, are at the beginning of transforming their learning and development practices. 
If you look at formal learning, as mentioned in the video, if you look at global research, an average of 32 hours of formal learning is provided to many people in organizations, depending on industry, role, uh, tenure, uh, culture, etc. And there are a number of different formats, like the classroom, but also uh, MOOCs and SPOCs, uh, virtual classroom, right? So there are many different uh, uh, delivery, delivery solutions. And McKinsey has started partnering with edX uh, since 2012. We have been reflecting on the huge need to develop leaders and people at scale globally. We have pulled in a number of researchers from a number of leading universities, and we have reflected on all the insights in pedagogy in terms of how people are using the platform, what's the best uh, duration of a video to engage people, and we have uh, enhanced the platform with specific functionality, and we have been developing a lot of courses over the years that we have made available for a lot of our clients, but also uh, for McKinsey colleagues around the world. Um, on a number of topics that are mostly business related, as you see on this slide, um, and have been very well received with a very high completion rate of typically 90 to 95 percent. And we always ask for a value for time spent uh, uh, score from people, and it's something like a 6.3 out of 7. So very high number of engage, uh, very high engagement level, uh, very successful content that we can deliver globally. In addition to that, if you think about corporate learning, it's also about how can we develop cultures where people learn on the job? Because people spend, you know, about 1,800 hours a year on the job. So how can we turn the workplace into a real learning place? And there are a number of things what to do. One is provide people with all kinds of assignments, actually, because that's how people learn, by moving them into a different role, a different project, a different assignment, shadowing leaders in the organization, getting coaching and feedback as one key component. Secondly, provide people with access to learning, information, um, knowledge at their fingertips through a number of different uh, exciting and innovative applications. And last but not least, what I call social learning, is basically connecting people with, uh, with other people so they can create knowledge, they can iterate on the new knowledge, and they can share knowledge among, them, among uh, different groups. So a whole portfolio of different learning solutions that will help people to develop capabilities for their next role. Now, also based on research, there are also some challenges with regards to the learner. What I believe is that people need to become aware that they will be probably in the workforce for quite some time. In many countries, uh, uh, retirement ages have been postponed, and particularly for a young generation, like, as an example, my son, who's 20 years old. I looked at the Dutch uh, uh, portal, uh, government portal for, uh, for uh, pension plans, and it says, your retirement age is 72, with a big disclaimer, uh, if life expectancy continues to go up, and if a couple of other conditions are met, it will be 75, etc., etc. So think about it, also about um, students that you have. They will be in the workforce for 50, 55 years. And in order to stay, to have marketable skills in the workforce, people need to continue reskill and upskill themselves. I have developed a number of mindsets for lifelong learners, and you can take a free assessment, and I hope you can share this with uh, colleagues, uh, with students, uh, MBA students particularly, 
to, to, to complete this survey and get a sense of how you are doing with regards to, a, to lifelong learning mindsets. And I will briefly walk through them in a second. It's focusing on growth, become a serial master, stretch yourself, build your personal brand, develop your own, own your own development journey, and last but not least, do what you love. So, if you think about development in organizations, uh, in the last century, the view was from many scientists that basically people could grow and develop themselves until their 30s, and then basically it would decline by 1% a year. Now, there's a pretty scary perspective, right? Uh, the good news is that today we know way more about how people develop themselves, and basically people can deal with different levels of complexity at a different age. So in this example, you see somebody uh, at, who's 30 years old, you know, the, the five or six different dots there, there are six different people who can deal with different levels of complexity. But overall, people can grow and develop, you know, over their lifetime. Also, a lot of IQ uh, uh, research uh, conf uh, confirms that basically people can develop their IQ over lifetime. However, there's one very important condition, and that is people need to embrace a growth mindset. Who is familiar with the work from Carol Dweck on mindsets? Some of you, I would recommend you to take a look at that. Carol Dweck is a professor at Stanford, has done for over 25 years work on, uh, on learning, and particularly has defined a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And people need to embrace a growth mindset as a key condition for overall learning and development. And as I mentioned, if, you know, the, the model from the 20th century was basically, you go to college, in your early 20s, you learn on the job, and that will do it. If you look at work from Linda Gretton, who's a professor at uh, London Business School, she published a couple of books the last couple of years, one of them is The Shift, and basically, based on he, her research, and we, conf we, we also believe in that at McKinsey, the future is way more about a specialist versus a gener generalist. Because uh, information is available at our fingertips on the internet. And therefore, you need people who need to know something about something, in addition to a number of social skills uh, in order to be successful. So, it's hardly likely that people will just be successful for 50 years if at one point in time they completed a bachelor degree or a master degree. And therefore, I argue that people at different times in their life, they need to go back to school, and school defined as anything, uh, an edX uh, course, an edX certification is an example, to build again deep skills in a new discipline that might be very close to their old discipline. The third mindset is on, is basically on, uh, it's not, it's on it's stretch. The header is wrong here. We know that people only learn if they do things they have never done before. In other words, you need to be outside of your comfort zone in order to learn something. So, key thing is asking yourself every day, are the things I do today that I did not do yesterday that will challenge me and that will help me to develop a new, a new skill or acquire new knowledge? And what you typically see in careers of people is that when people are changing careers, changing roles, or get involved in a new activity, that if you see on this S-curve, at the beginning of the S, you will learn a lot. Everything is new. If you probably reflect on changing, you changed an organization, well, then everything is new. You need to, new, need to know new colleagues, 
new systems, there are new challenges, and that's where you really develop yourself. Then there is a moment on the S-curve where you are really in your comfort zone and you can execute and you are successful. And then typically what happens, if people are too long in a role and there are limited opportunities to get out of your comfort zone, impact and development starts slowing down and uh, people are not developing themselves anymore. If you look at um, the recruitment market, um, still an estimate of 70% of people find a role through somebody else. They know somebody from another organization who knows them and understands the skill set, what he or she brings to the table, will be introduced to the, to the recruitment team, and as a consequence, will get interviewed and has a higher chance for a job. Now, of course, in order to be, you know, to be connected, people need to build their brand. What are they known for? What are they good at? And also expand their network. And then, of course, from a credentialing perspective, you know, having your edX uh, certification program on your LinkedIn profile will help you to position you for other work in the future. Owning your development journey, it's key that people take ownership of their journey, create their own learning goals, work with mentors. A condition for learning is to stay vital, stay healthy, measure your progress, but also make personal investments in your, in your learning. And last but not least, if people are in the workforce for 50 plus years, and work eight, nine, ten hours a day, guess what? It makes sense to figure out what you really like to do, right? And I'd like to show you um, a visual on that, a couple of steps that people can, can reflect on for themselves in terms of what they love to do, what does the world need? What are, can you be paid for? What are you good at? And basically, in the middle is Iggy Guy, and I will show you a small, a short video on that as a closure. Okinawa には生きがいという言葉があります。毎朝起きる原動力を与えてくれるものだと思います。目覚ましい本当に遠くに投げ捨てようかなと思う時もあるんだけど我慢して自分のお尻に鞭を打って起きて走りに行きます。私の生きがいは、まあ、いつも馬,馬に会いに行くために、まあ、仕事を欲しに行きながら、まあ、責任を持って人とママとも接していっていますね、まあ、お客さんにがね喜んでもらえたら一番嬉しいんだけど、うん、いや自分には兄弟もいないしこの孫たちがたくさんでたまには孫たちが寄ってくるさにもう本当これが生きがいである。チャンンピオンになりたいんだって俺はなるんだって家族のためにチームのために自分自身のためにということが生きがいですね家族があったり友達がいたりいて、まあ、みんなに助けられてこいつのために助けたいとかそれを国も思わずできたり仕事も目標があってそれに対しての勉強や努力は全然疲れない。苦にならない現状のことじゃないですかね一日楽しむために起きています沖縄ではハッピー毎日がまあ幸せであればそれで生きがい
Okay, thank you so much. I hope this was uh, interesting.